For the past few months after my trip to Japan, I have actually been searching for a compact 35mm travel and event camera. The Contax G1 is a small automatic camera and has some of the best lenses for 35mm film ever created. It also has some serious drip. When you're at a wedding and wearing a suit, this camera honestly just kind of slaps. Now you might ask, why didn't I just get a compact camera? Now I did look at cameras like this, the Nikon 35 Ti and the tiny Minolta TC1, but I didn't like the idea of buying one. If a compact camera breaks severely, there is no way out. You can't just buy a new body or a lens. If it breaks, it breaks. Also, to me, such small cameras with motorized retractable lenses and film advancing mechanisms might break easier with more moving parts and things to go wrong. It is a lot of complexity in a very small body. Now the G series were built as pro or prosumer cameras and it seems like they would be less likely to break compared to a compact camera. But if the body explodes, I can replace it and in the worst case scenario, I can adapt the lenses to a mirrorless camera instead. Also, the G1 and these premium compact cameras cost about the same now, so buying the G1 honestly just seemed to be the better buy. Now, some people actually call the G1 and G2 autofocus rangefinder cameras, but I don't. I actually consider it an interchangeable lens point and shoot camera. Here we have the G1. Starting at the top, we have the exposure counter here with this little LCD. And behind it, we have our manual focus dial. I'll talk about this a little later on. Around the shutter button, we have the switch, to turn the camera on and off. And yes, it is opposite to the Nikon way of doing it. So I keep actually turning the camera to AEL mode instead of turning it off over and over again. And the autofocus is triggered on the shutter button by pressing it halfway down. Like so. Next, we have the shutter speed dial with exposure compensation. Now the shutter speeds on this range from one two thousandth of a second all the way down to one second with a bulb and flash mode. We also have our exposure compensation on this dial. It's currently set to auto, but you can turn up your exposure compensation to plus one or plus two for the internal meter to do in exposure compensation. And then if we press the lock, we can switch it over to manual shutter speed where we get to choose our exposure. One kind of annoying thing with this is that it's quite easy to bump this dial and end up on the wrong exposure. Now, generally I actually check this before I shoot here and in the viewfinder, there is a way to check it. So something you need to kind of pay attention to. There is a solid click though on the auto setting, which is quite hard to switch out of. Underneath the shutter speed dial, we have our bracketing switch. So we can just move it to the first position. And that means it will take three shots with plus or minus half a stop and then to the second position, which is plus or minus one full stop. Here we have a hot shoe for flashes. This camera does have TTL functionality, and I do plan to get the TLA 200 flash for this camera at some point. On the left of the camera, we have our drive and ISO buttons. The drive modes available are single shot, continuous, self timer, and multiple exposures. Next, we have the ISO button, and that is used to select the camera's ISO. So the way you do that is you press the ISO to bring it up, then hold it down. And once it starts blinking, like so, you can then tap the ISO button to lower the ISO or raise it using the drive button. If you go all the way down, you can then get to DX where the camera will automatically select the ISO based on the DX reading of the canisters. The default ISO, if it doesn't have a DX canister, is 100. On the left side of the body, we have our PC sync port here under a little screw cover, which I'm not going to bother taking out and the latch for opening the film door, like so. Now on the bottom of the camera, we have our tripod socket and our rewind button. Now the rewind button is very hard to press. You need to use a little tool or something pokey to poke it. And that is because the camera is not really meant to be rewound halfway through roll, but you can force it to rewind with this little button. And here we have the battery compartment, which can be opened with a coin. Pro tip here, if you use a Japanese camera that has one of these coin slots on it, you can always open them with a five yen coin because that's what it's made for and it fits perfectly. 
So it might be worth getting yourself a 5 yen coin. It also has a hole in it, which means it can be put on your keys. On the back of the camera, we have our film window, so we can see what film is in the camera. And we also have here under this is the cable release socket. Uh, here's obviously our viewfinder, and we actually have a diopter adjustment as well. Going around to the front of the camera, we have our lens release here. So we just push this in and then rotate the knurled part of the lens. And then the lens just comes off the camera. And now that we have the lens off, we can see that Contax has been up to their usual tricks with rangefinder mounts and making them way over complicated because this lens is pretty much a breech lock mount. Uh, unlike most cameras, which are just the standard bayonet mount, this acts kind of like the older FD lenses where you actually kind of rotate the rear part of the flanges behind the locks into place. It's a pretty easy mount. You just line up the red dots, in she goes, and then just twist to lock into place. And then on the front of the lens, of course, we have our aperture ring where we select our aperture and then the camera will meter for that aperture because this is an aperture priority camera. As for using the G1, I have to address the autofocus issue because it's nonsense. I've actually only had about one shot out of focus and that was because I was hammered drunk at a wedding and I ended up missing the focus point. So then how did I achieve this feat of camera operation? Well, I did the one thing most people don't do. Read, idiots, read. I read the fecking manual and it tells you, believe it or not, how to use the camera. So here is a guide on how to use the autofocus system on the G1. So if you miss focus with this camera, so, so if you miss focus with this camera, it's more or less your error. Check the focus scale before you shoot. Now that I've berated my entire audience, it's time to talk about the rest of the camera. And it is lovely to use with solid dials, good buttons, nice clicks, except for the power switch, which is backwards compared to Nikon and I keep pressing in the wrong direction, but that's my issue. The only thing I really want on it is back button focus, which is something I use on all my cameras. And the G2 has back button focus, so maybe that will happen in the future. As for lenses, I only have the 45mm f2 Carl's Ice planner lens, and it is beautiful. 
It has a lovely sharp rendering corner to corner. I've used it for portraits of friends and family at events and it just looks so goddamn good. That rendering is just beautiful. I do actually plan to get the 28mm f2 Biogon which is also supposed to be just as good as the 45mm. Now the full set of lenses available on the G system are the 16 and 21mm which need external viewfinders, the 28, 35, 45 and 90mm and there is a 35 to 70mm zoom lens. But when it comes to picking lenses, not all lenses work on all bodies. So that means I'm going to have to explain this. And if I get it wrong, I'm sure the comments down below will correct me. So there are three bodies available. The G1 silver label, the G1 green label, and the G2. Now the first version, the G1 silver label, is only compatible with the 16, 28, 45, and 90 millimeter lenses. The G1 green label can use all of those lenses and the 21 and 35 millimeter lenses as well. And then the G2 can use all lenses, including the zoom lens. Now you might ask, what is a green, uh, now you might ask what the green and silver label G1s are. Well, if you look in the film compartment, you'll see it either has a silver or green label. My one is a green label, so that means I can use it with all prime lenses. The reason is very simple. As new lenses came out, as the system grew, the older bodies weren't compatible with the newer lenses. They needed an electronics update. So the manufacturer actually had an option where you could send your body back in, have it updated to handle the new lenses, and then they would send it back with a green label in the film compartment to denote that it had been updated. So there's no actual difference between the green and silver label G1s. It's just one of them can recognize different lenses. The viewfinder on the camera is, um, well, it's one of the viewfinders of all time. Now I have heard that the viewfinder is not inspiring, but I find that kind of backwards to how I work. I only use it as a tool for framing. I generally have a pre-visualization of what I want the shot to be, and then I frame it in the viewfinder. Now the viewfinder itself does actually have parallax correction, but no frame lines. Instead, it adjusts the optics of the viewfinder to change the field of view to match the lens. Now it does this by having a sort of zoom lens in the viewfinder, and there's this little pin that is moved by the lens when you lock the lens in place, which zooms the viewfinder to the right field of view. And then in the bottom of the viewfinder, we have a little LCD that displays the focus distance, if exposure compensation is set, and the shutter speed. So now that we know how to use the G1, I think it's time to take it for a test drive to Inishmore. After a quick drive across the country to Doolin and getting on a ferry to the Aran Islands, which was definitely an uneventful crossing and didn't involve my friend getting thrown into the air by rough seas, multiple people getting sick and children screaming about how we're all going to die. Oh, I kind of feel sick now. Really? We reached the Aran Islands where we rented bicycles and headed off.
what do I think about the G1? Well, from the fry rolls that I've put through this camera so far, I have found that the G1 appears to be exactly what I needed. It fit the role I had in mind perfectly, and I can see it coming with me on a lot of future trips and to all family events. In fact, I have a long upcoming trip to Asia that I'm planning to bring the G1 on. It also means I'm going to have another super long video to make about that trip. Yay! But if the G1 holds up for that trip and the amount of film I'm going to put through it during the first half, I might have to have a G2 body fall into my suitcase in Tokyo for the second half of the trip around Japan. Anyway, that's all I have on the G1. See you next time.